Welcome back to Killer Stories. I'm your host, Bobby Holmes. This week's episode is sponsored by Bar Forte of Kaysville, Utah. Bar Forte is a woman-owned boutique bar fitness studio, the first in Davis County, located in Kaysville, Utah. The owners, Cindy and Janelle, are not just business partners. They are best friends and fitness enthusiasts. They met teaching Bar and shared a dream of owning a studio of their own. Bar Forte combines the best of ballet, yoga, and Pilates foundational principles, which focus on isolating, overloading, and stretching each muscle group, resulting in improved strength, posture, and balance. They strive to create a comfortable environment and ensure that new and seasoned clients feel like they belong, both in and outside of class. Bar Forte opened on July 30th. Cindy, Janelle, and their staff are eager to connect with their community and build an awesome clientele. Take advantage of their new client deal and try them out. Two weeks of unlimited classes for $10. Find them on Instagram at Bar Forte Kaysville and click the link in their bio to purchase this offer. I will also have the link in my show notes. Bar Forte hosted a few free pop-ups before their grand opening, and I attended one of those and was hooked. I absolutely hate cardio, so what I love about Bar is that it's low impact and I can feel myself getting stronger every single class. Janelle and Cindy are so welcoming. I used to think I needed a workout buddy to keep me motivated, but even when I attend class alone, I feel like I'm sweating it out with a group of friends. If you live in Davis County, Utah, you need to check out Bar Forte Kaysville. Now for today's episode. I'm covering the murder of a five-year-old Canadian girl, Phoenix Sinclair. I will be discussing a severe case of child abuse, and details may be distressing for some listeners. I don't usually give a trigger warning because everything I talk about is horrible, but when children are involved, it's extra heartbreaking. Phoenix Sinclair was born April 23, 2000 in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Her mother's name was Samantha Kamach and her father, Stephen Sinclair. The moment she was born, she was whisked away by Child and Family Services, or CFS. Samantha and Stephen had already proved themselves as shitty parents who endangered their previous children. Phoenix's older sibling was a permanent ward of the state. Near the end of Samantha's pregnancy with Phoenix, the couple was assessed and declared, quote, unprepared to care for a baby. Unprepared? As in they don't have a crib, car seat, or bottles? To me, that's what unprepared means. I think it's more like not fit or incompetent to care for a baby. They both had drug and alcohol problems, specifically crack cocaine. Phoenix was put into foster care, but her birth parents were allowed visitation. Social services provided Samantha and Stephen with training on how to properly care for a child in the hopes they could rehabilitate. The training and assessment by CFS was later declared inadequate. Come September, they handed five-month-old baby Phoenix over to these monsters. There were supposed to be weekly visits with a social worker to evaluate and offer in-home support. That did not happen. Almost a year to the day following Phoenix's birth, Samantha has another baby girl, Echo. I mean no disrespect to innocent baby Echo, but part of their training should include how to use a condom, given they are so unprepared for a child. Another assessment was done, but this time CFS found no reason for a change of custody of the newborn. So Samantha and Stephen now have two infants. I only have one child, but I've heard the jump from one to two is so hard, especially for those who have two still in diapers. It seems like quite the challenge. Turns out the challenge was too much for this couple. A domestic call was made to police in June, and by early July, Samantha and Stephen were separated. Both girls were living with their father, Stephen Sinclair. Well, according to CFS records, they lived with their dad. 
but in reality, the girls were cared for mainly by a family friend, Rohan Stevenson and his wife, Kim Edwards. Stephen Sinclair would drop off the girls and disappear on a bender for days or even weeks at a time. Sadly, Echo died July 15th from complications of a respiratory infection. She was only three months old. The family friends taking care of Phoenix, Rohan and Kim, ended up separating and she moved out. Rohan worked graveyard shifts, leaving his 11-year-old and 14-year-old boys in the care of one-year-old Phoenix through the night, which couldn't be fun for those boys. I know my son was still waking through the night at that age, assuming they actually cared for her and didn't just neglect her. Hard to know for sure. CFS was well aware of Phoenix and her case. They were contacted multiple times that summer. And the funny thing was, Stephen Sinclair was never around when they stopped by, and apparently that wasn't a problem. But things seemed to calm down, and after a year without incident, Phoenix's case was closed, even though Stephen was supposed to go through drug and alcohol classes and never did. Her case was reopened February of 2003, when two-year-old Phoenix was hospitalized, a nurse noticed something stuck inside of her nose. It was a piece of styrofoam that had been lodged there for approximately four months. It created a nasty infection, and Phoenix would need antibiotics to treat it. The nurse and doctors were concerned that she was being neglected at home. They didn't have confidence that Stephen would give her the antibiotics as prescribed, but Phoenix was released back into his care anyways. CFS was supposed to do a follow-up regarding the situation, but that never happened. Four months later, she was back in foster care. Stephen had a giant party at his home, exposing Phoenix to drugs and alcohol for days on end. Somehow, CFS was informed of the house party, and she was taken from his custody. Strings were pulled, and Rohan Stevenson and Kim Edwards were given temporary guardianship of Phoenix. I guess Kim is back in the picture again. Rohan admits that he did not follow the rules set by CFS. If Stephen wanted to see Phoenix, he let him. He said he didn't respect authority figures and realized they rarely followed up or monitored his actions. One day, Samantha Kamach showed up at Rohan's door. She asked to take Phoenix for a while. He didn't see why not. She was her mother after all. Well, Samantha didn't bring her back. After a few days, Stephen Sinclair reported her to CFS. Even though she basically kidnapped Phoenix, Samantha was later granted custody of her in early 2005, which is bonkers. CFS paid a visit to Samantha's home and made the decision all was well, even though they never laid eyes on Phoenix. Maybe because Stephen was doing a piss-poor job at parenting, they would let her give it a try. But this turned out to be a horrible, horrible mistake. Samantha had a new live-in boyfriend, Carl Wesley McKay. If you thought Samantha was a shitty parent before, Wesley brought out the worst in her. I'll admit, when my son would randomly repeat a swear word I said, I would laugh hysterically before explaining to him that only grown-ups can talk like that. For now, he's not allowed to use those words. Well, Samantha was training Phoenix to swear and belittle herself, saying things like, I'm an effing bitch. Samantha and Wesley had another child in November of 2004. Shortly after, reports of abuse were filed to CFS, but nothing came of it. If you can't tell, social services played a huge role in the fate of Phoenix Sinclair. They had many opportunities to intervene and prevent her death. The system failed her. That year on Christmas morning, Phoenix opened all of her presents. Then, Samantha took them back and said she was too bad and didn't deserve them. This woman is pure evil. Can you imagine how poor little Phoenix felt? A friend of Samantha's was concerned with how she and Wesley treated Phoenix. She made a call to CFS but wanted to remain anonymous. 
the CFS worker on the other line told her if she wanted her complaints taken seriously, she needed to give her name, which is complete bullshit. There's a reason why she wanted to remain anonymous. The complaint should be followed up regardless. A child is involved. Wesley had two older sons of his own, aged 12 and 14, who split time between him and his ex. They were key witnesses to the abuse Phoenix endured. Phoenix, who was now five years old, was locked away in the basement. No bed, pillow, or even a blanket for comfort. Just a cold cement floor. She was barely fed at all, but when she was, she often vomited. Samantha and Wesley forced her to eat her own vomit. Wesley used Phoenix for target practice, shooting her with a pellet gun. Let me explain to you how a pellet gun works. Even though pellets are not bullets, they will bury under the skin. Then they butterfly and double up in size, which can cause excruciating pain on the victim. Pellet guns often cause deep puncture wounds that can cause nerve damage, severe infections, and even death. And of course, poor Phoenix was not treated for any of her injuries. Samantha and Wesley played a game with Phoenix. I can't even believe they referred to this as a game because it's not a game at all. It's torture. They called it Choke the Chicken. With their hands around her little neck, they would hold her up and choke her until she fell unconscious, then throw her on the floor. Wesley's older sons told investigators that Phoenix would twitch and make horrible sounds afterwards. The lack of oxygen to the brain during strangulation is what causes unconsciousness, but there are many other side effects that can happen. Blood flow to the head is stopped, creating an intense pressure that feels as if your head is going to explode. It can also cause damage to the larynx and hyoid bone, permanent bloodshot eyes, and ringing in the ears. Not to mention doing this repeatedly is sure to cause brain damage. I cannot even imagine someone doing this to a child, their own child. This case is so hard for me, you guys. Phoenix is very close in age to my own son, and my heart hurts so bad for this innocent little girl. For whatever reason, she was singled out and the only child living with the couple who endured this kind of torture and abuse. June 11th, 2005, Phoenix received a severe beating from Wesley McKay. He kicked and punched her for a solid 15 minutes. Samantha sat on the steps of the basement and watched. Just a normal day. Not a care in the world. When the couple left the house, one of Wesley's sons went down to check on Phoenix and discovered she wasn't breathing. Out of fear for their own safety, the boys did not report her death to police. When Wesley and Samantha returned, surprisingly, they tried to revive her. They moved Phoenix to the bathtub and splashed her with water. When that didn't work, they attempted CPR, but she was gone. They wrapped Phoenix's body in plastic and buried her in a shallow grave at the local dump, like garbage. Samantha and Wesley went on with their life, pretending Phoenix was still alive, continuing to cash their welfare checks, listing her as a dependent. That check is probably the only reason they wanted custody of Phoenix in the first place, and why Samantha keeps popping out babies. Speaking of which, the couple had their second child together in December of 2005. In early 2006, Wesley McKay's two sons from a previous marriage went back to live with his ex-wife full-time. The boys told their mother what happened to Phoenix. She was horrified and reported it to the police, nine months after her death. Wesley's ex told police that he was physically abusive to her in their marriage as well. He knew where to hit her so bruises would be hidden by her clothing. She was home alone often and kept a machete nearby for protection. Wesley once chased her around the house with that machete. She feared for her life that day. In my sources, I found the statement, Samantha tried to pass off another girl as Phoenix. 
Did she abduct another little girl and tell her she now answers to the name Phoenix? Or did she bribe a friend's child to pretend when CFS came around? Either way, police saw right through her ruse. Samantha Kamach and Carl Wesley McKay were arrested in suspicion of murdering five-year-old Phoenix Sinclair. Wesley led police to the body of Phoenix Sinclair buried near the city dump. The jury was unanimous in their guilty verdict. In December of 2008, Samantha and Wesley were sentenced to 25 years in prison without the possibility of parole. Wesley McKay seemed to be remorseful and apologized for his actions. Samantha, on the other hand, feels she is completely innocent and does not deserve her sentence. She said, quote, I loved Phoenix. Everyone can say what they want to say. Call me whatever they want. But I never did this, and I know that Phoenix knows that. I can say sorry to everybody, but I know that won't change anything. I hate this woman. Now for child and family services. They aren't getting away with their neglect in the case of Phoenix. Family Services Minister Carrie Irvin Ross apologized on behalf of the province. She said, The child welfare system failed Phoenix Sinclair. We deeply regret and are profoundly saddened by the loss of this child. Unquote. CFS was taken to court for a $14 million public inquiry. There were 126 witness testimonies on how Phoenix's case was mishandled. It basically ended with, we'll try harder. Carrie Irvin Ross said the goal is to take steps to correct the problem in the system, but it is unrealistic to think the recommendations will prevent another death. That statement makes my skin crawl. Apparently, social workers have way too much on their plate, causing mass confusion. Each worker is supposed to have a max of 20 cases, but they are overworked, hiring people quickly without proper training, resulting in confusion for staff and lost or misplaced files. In other words, it's a hot mess. And sadly, the number of children coming into the Manitoba welfare system continues to rise. Let's hope they get their act together quickly. August 8th, 2022, just a few weeks ago, Samantha Kamach was granted escorted temporary absence from prison. She is now allowed to visit family members and an Indigenous elder for spiritual development. Quote, The Parole Board of Canada believes that more exposure to your culture will aid you in your healing journey as well as managing your risk factors more effectively, furthering your reintegration into society. Maybe I'm cold-hearted, but if she is sentenced to 25 years without the possibility of parole, her family and Indigenous elders can come visit her in prison. She has only served 13 years. I could rant my opinion on the matter, but as an American true crime podcaster, my opinion will have no effect on how the Canadian Parole Board treats their prisoners. So it won't. That's it for today's episode. If you are enjoying the show, the biggest compliment you could give is sharing killer stories with your true crime loving friends. It is also super helpful to leave a rating on Spotify or a written review on Apple Podcasts. I wanted to give a shout out to listener Nina Laverne. There was a Facebook post asking for true crime podcast recommendations, and she had the nicest things to say about myself and the show. Great host who can captivate you in minutes. Her storytelling is next level. She gives just the right amount of details and doesn't disappoint. The audio is clear. No distracting background noise or crazy music during the podcast. I was a huge crime junkie fan until one day I clicked on killer stories and I never went back. Keep sending your story suggestions to killerstoriespodcast at gmail.com. Follow me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Killer Stories Podcast, and I'm on Twitter at Killer Story Pod. As a reminder, I will have the link for Bar Forte Kaysville in my show notes. I urge you to check them out if you are local. You won't be disappointed. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, this has been a killer story. <laughs>